Lord. The date today is April the 6th, 2022. As we continue to shift our practice, as provincial measures continue to change, we are making every effort to get back to some in-person meetings at the board table. For tonight, however, in this virtual environment, we will continue to navigate with a combination of Google Forms and the functions in Google Meets. Trustees will be directing all their questions through the chair, and as always, a reminder of the meeting rules of the road to guide us through our meeting to effectively and respectfully deal with the business of the board. I will now take roll call in the standard traditional alphabetical order today. Trustee Amos. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Trustee Bao. Maybe Trustee Bao is a little bit late. I'll come back to her at the end. Trustee Collard is here, but she is on the phone, so I know that she's here in her absence of voice. Uh, Trustee Danielli. Thank you. I am here. Great. Vice Chair Harrison. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Trustee Garrett. Good evening from North Halton. <laughs> Trustee Gray. Hi there. Happy to be here. Trustee Gubetz. Oh, you can't, I can't hear you. So no volume, but you are here. You are here. <laughs> it's one of those nights I can just feel it. Trustee Oliver. Good evening, everyone. Trustee Reynolds. Hello, everybody. Trustee Rosha. Hello from East Oakville. Trustee Vidil and Kara. I'll, I'll say it one more time. Trustee Vidilankara. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, and Trustee Bao, have you joined? Good evening, everyone. Sorry. Oh, wonderful. Good evening. It's great to have everybody here. Uh, Director Ennis, could you please note the staff that are in attendance this evening? Thank you, Chair Shuttleworth, and good evening, trustees, and to everyone watching. Uh, we have a full complement of senior staff here this evening to support the board meeting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So tonight, Trustee Grevents will be honoring the land. Oh, and nobody can hear me either. I'm laughing out loud to myself. So um, I can read it unless we have a volunteer who would like to take Trustee Grevents' place. So I'll read it for this evening then. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern tradition of the many First Nation and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Attawadaron, the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in Indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honour and respect the four directions, land, water, plants, animals ancestors that walk before us, and all of the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with us. Thank you, and tonight we are beginning another new tradition of formally acknowledging the History and Heritage Month as identified by the Government of Ontario. These are times not only to celebrate, but also to educate our communities about the various groups and their contributions to both Canadian and Ontario's history. The month of April is Sikh Heritage Month. Sikh Heritage Month is an opportunity to remember, celebrate, and educate future generations about Sikh Canadians and the important role that they have played and continue to play in communities across Ontario. April is an important month for the Sikh community. In this month, Sikh Canadians celebrate the Saki, which marks the creation of the Kasla and the Sikh Articles of Faith. Sikh Canadians widely celebrate Baisaki, also known as Kasla Day across Ontario, or New Year's Day. To all our Sikh, Sikh communities celebrating the Saki on April the 14th, the trustees of the Halton District School Board would like to wish you 
Nave Sela Mubay Raka. Thank you very much. Next, we are up to the agenda. Trustee Oliver, would you like to move a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Oh, approve the agenda. Sorry. I move the motion. Great. Uh -huh. Trustee Gavance, would you like to second that motion? Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion? Uh, Trustee Rosha. Um, through the chair, I guess it's more of a question of clarification. Um, right now on the agenda, the trustee expense governance procedure is under for decision for this evening. I, I was under the impression that any changes to uh, governance, pol well, to policy governance procedure was a two week period. So it would come to the board one time and then a second time. So it came, I, I can respond to that. Oh, sorry. Ahead, I can respond. Um, yes, it, it, uh, it came for its first reading at the last meeting and it doesn't need to go to committee as a whole because the changes we're making are changes that we have to make since there have been changes to the transportation um, formula, uh, the way that we submit our transportation expenses. And the second one was for the um, agreement to have annual governance training. Any other changes in policy or uh, cosmetic um, housekeeping types of changes. So there is no need for it to go to committee as a whole. And um, I believe that there were no questions about the changes uh, at the last meeting. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there any further discussions? A uh, point no. of procedural order, please. Uh, yes. Sorry, uh, I, I just, uh, my internet's not really great. So I was trying hard to listen to um, what was just discussed. Did I understand that the, ex the item expense um, report, expenses, trustee expenses, had come to our board table previously? What meeting yes. was that, please? So I, that I thought was, it only came to committee the whole. So that was at our last board meeting, Trustee yes. Reynolds. If you recall originally, Clyde, remember, because if you recall originally, it was seen as an item for action. Okay. We had to amend the order of the agenda because it was actually for information to come back to this meeting today. Got it. Okay, thank you for the clarity. Thank you very much. No worries. All right, with those discussions, hopefully, coming, are there any objections to approving the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. We are now up to declarations of possible conflicts of interest. Are there any possible conflicts of interest pertaining to the public meeting this evening? Again, wonderful seeing none. And so now we're up to the most wonderful time of the evening, the Inspire Awards. Tonight, we are honored to present four Inspire Awards. An Inspire Award is given to an individual or a group that is formally or informally associated with the Halton District School Board, who supports our students and their achievements through exemplary caring, initiative, innovation, and creativity. Tonight, we are presenting four awards for the March nominations. Trustee Grabenz will be running the presentation, which has been wonderfully created by Heather Francie in the Communications Department. Before each presentation, I will name the recipient and the name of the trustee who will be presenting. Tonight, we are starting off with the Inspire Award for the Halton District School Board Purchasing Department, uh, centered at the JW Singleton Center, and I will be presenting this. The HDSB purchasing team includes Mario Aruda, officer, Dave Bennett, Manager of Procurement and Administration, Amanda Chatelaine, Supervisor, Heather Fiorelli, Buyer, Costa Pangarakis, Buyer, 
Diane Brewer for her role as buyer, Austin Lurkey for his role as officer, and Kingsley Lachance, a head caretaker. Before we begin this award, I would like to take some time to pay tribute to Kingsley Lachance, who passed away on March the 20th. Kingsley was a longtime employee of the Halton District School Board who began his career in 1995. Kingsley was the head caretaker at Lakeshore Public School for many years, and for the past two years, he was the head caretaker at Robert Bateman, where he has been a great support to the purchasing department's PPE team, as well as the staff working in the virtual school secondary. Throughout the pandemic, the HDSB purchasing team has had to pivot how they function as they are now responsible for running a complex distribution warehouse for personal protective equipment. This includes managing incoming shipments, inventory tracking and packaging, and the distribution of PPE to schools, all while continuing to fulfill their regular purchasing responsibilities. The distribution of rapid antigen tests for students and staff added another layer to the time commitment and responsibility of these staff members. Throughout all of this, they continued to promptly answer calls and emails from staff across the HDS field and deal with requests from all stakeholders, whether it be related to PPE or regular purchasing requirements of the board. Providing monthly PPE to all HDSB facilities daycares, and bus operators, the purchasing department unloaded over 200 trucks carrying PPE to the warehouse, loaded more than 100 trucks to deliver the PPE to HDSB schools, and distribute 11,466,778 pieces of PPE to schools, all while supporting schools with their daily purchasing needs. The purchasing department deserves to be recognized for their extraordinary efforts throughout the past year. I cannot express how grateful we are to all of you. Thank you so much and congratulations on your award. Next up, we have Maria Kostaki and Kate Patterson from Munns Public School and Trustee Amos will be presenting this award. Thank you, it is my honor to present the Inspire Award to Maria Kostaki and Kate Patterson, who are teachers at Munns Public School. As a teaching team in the French Immersion Program, they have gone above and beyond this year to educate and inspire both students and parents about Indigenous people in Canada. In their classroom, they teach students about the lack of clean and safe water in Indigenous communities throughout Canada and help students write letters to the government to express their concerns. Maria and Kate have shown students that their voices count and have demonstrated to them how to take action on injustice. Outside the classroom, they facilitate a parents' book club where they focus on the heartbreaking treatment of Indigenous children. Parents say that this book club has been one of the most informative, enriching parent engagement initiatives that they have ever been part of. This type of parent engagement that Maria and Kate are leading truly helps parents connect to the education being taught in schools. Parents, guardians are grateful to Maria and Kate for helping to bridge our education gap so they can learn more about the country we live in while supporting their children's education. Thank you so much for all that you have done to inspire us all. Congratulations. Thank you so much. We are now up to Megan Katal Samo, or AKA Mrs. Kat, from Tiger Jeet Singh Public School, and Trustee Garrett will be presenting. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my honor to present Kat Alfamo, uh, who's at, uh, with the Inspire Award. She is a teacher at Tiger Jeet Public School. For students struggling with their mental health, Megan helps alongside their parents and guardians to identify the issues and work together to improve students' well-being and minimize stress. Parents commend Megan on her caring nature and the empathy and initiative she takes to support student well-being. Megan ensures parents are kept informed on how their child 
is doing at school and how they can all work together to support the student's success. Parents are grateful for Megan's advocacy and care for their children's well-being and success. Way to make it count, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Heather Sleepbeiner from Rolling Meadows Public School and Trustee Grabantz will be presenting. I'm so glad my microphone has, is working again because I would hate to miss giving out this wonderful award to a wonderful person. Heather Finkbeiner is the principal at Rolling Meadows Public School. Heather is usually found in a classroom or in the halls connecting with students and staff. She gravitates to everyone and makes it a priority to welcome new students and supply teachers, itinerant staff to help them feel comfortable and supported. Heather goes above and beyond in everything she does to support students and staff and ensure they have the resources they need to be successful. In the winter, Heather is known to do some extra shoveling around the school to make walkways wider and easier to space out. She is always on top of the changing COVID-19 health and safety requirements and ensures her staff have all the information they need and answers to any questions they have. As soon as in-person learning was able to resume earlier this year, Heather was quick to get the school's literacy nights running again. Under Heather's leadership, Rolling Meadows Public School is a school all staff love to work at. Congratulations, Heather. Wonderful, thank you so much. Congratulations to all the Inspire Award recipients for your outstanding support of students within the Halton District School Board, supporting and promoting their achievement and well-being. A special thank you to Susan Frasher in the director's office, who every month works to ensure trustees have all they need to assess the nominees. For everyone watching this evening, please continue to nominate people or organizations who support our students and their achievements through their exemplary caring, initiative, innovation, and creativity. The nomination form is available on the hdsb.ca website. Everyone in the Halton District School Board community can nominate or be nominated. Families, neighbors, related organizations, staff, students, and school volunteer. These nominations are then reviewed by the trustees to ensure that they are truly inspiring. Thank you so much again for tonight's presentations. So as for our agenda tonight, we have no delegations this evening. However, we do have one presentation tonight to further expand on the amazing work from our purchasing team in supporting our school board through the pandemic. I am honored to be able to pass the mic over to Dave Bennett to talk to us about the amazing things that have happened behind the scenes with our PPE purchasing. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this evening to Madam Chair, Trustees of the Board, Director Annis, Associate Director Bogue and the Superintendents. Again, thank you for the opportunity and for the honour of receiving the Inspire Award. The challenge with the pandemic, it's been very challenging for everyone at the Board. Um, the Board has had to change, had to pivot, had to rethink how they had to do everything, they had to re-image the way that they did business, how they educated and how we operated on a day-to-day -day basis. Throughout this, one of the challenges that we undertook was to deal with PPE, so all the personal protective equipment that was being provided by the province. The purchasing team very quietly behind the scenes developed a plan to create a fairly complex logistical network to be able to receive the PPE in and then to be able to have a system for schools to order the PPE and then to be able to get the distributed out to the schools. When we initially undertook this challenge, I don't think we understood the magnitude of what we were actually getting into. Our operations started out very small at the New Street location. We had a small tech classroom at the back of the building with a roll-up door, and we thought this was more than enough space for us to operate. Uh, we received our first order of PPE in, which was hand sanitizer, and didn't appear to be that bad. We used the compound out back, the weather was nice, 
we got everything organized. We had a trucking department that helped us out to get everything. And that was the first delivery that we made out to schools. From there, we didn't realize, but the operation was going to become quite large very quickly. We expanded from a small room at the back of the school. We moved into the Brock room. We quickly filled the Brock room. Then we took over all the empty meeting spaces at New Street. And then we filled the hallways with PPE that was coming in. And on a monthly basis, we emptied all of that PPE. It was all organized and packed for individual schools. It was shipped out. And then we did this process over again. So we've done this process 21 times during the pandemic where we've emptied a space and filled it up. Just when we thought we were getting good at doing this, everything changed for us, just like everything else for the board. We moved to a different space because we quickly outgrew the space that was available for us at New Street. We moved over to Robert Bateman Secondary School and quickly filled up that facility with PPE. And with the changing complexity of the PPE coming in, as everyone knows, with the rapid antigen tests, they're temperature sensitive, they're time sensitive, they've got expiry dates, and then there was the all-important de-kitting process that everyone had to deal with. That challenge was interesting to overcome, but everybody put their heads together, came up with a production line that was supported by an extensive amount of volunteers that came in on weekends to help us out to organize, de-kit, label, package, and then be able to get everything out to the schools in time for it. And just very quickly, just wanted to touch base or just expand on a few things. So the backbone of the team in starting out, Diane Brewer and Austin Lurkey, they laid the groundwork for a lot of things that happened for the PPE distribution. Uh, they carried the torch. They worked some incredibly long hours in some incredibly challenging weather. They shoveled snow. They worked in the rain. They guided trucks. They directed traffic. They did all kinds of things at the start of it. Diane and Austin went on to explore some different opportunities with the board, but their commitment and their help was just invaluable. From that backbone, they passed the torch on to Heather Fiorelli and to Costa Tangarakis. They took the foundation that was laid by Diane and Austin, and they've created it into the system that we have in place now. So with the system, when it works well, it's quiet and it's seamless, and we don't get phone calls about it. And so far, it's been excellent. With it, again, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the help that we've received from caretaking staff throughout the board, as well as the flexibility from the principals and from senior management and their help and support as we try to navigate the trying times. And again, from the caretaking end of things, I just wanted to mention Laz De Selva from New Street, who was instrumental in opening doors, changing things. He fixed everything that we broke. He cleaned up after us and everything, as well as Kingsley. Kingsley very quickly became part of the purchasing team. He was an invaluable member with our team and he did tremendous work with us and his presence is missed. With everything that went on, uh, Madam Chair, you had touched on with the sort of the numbers that we do and because purchasing is part of business services, and with our colleagues in business services, they are very focused on the numbers of everything. So just to touch base with some of those 200 trucks that arrived, some trucks were good, some trucks were better, some trucks didn't have lift gates on the backs. And the team that helped out with everything, they unloaded 53 foot trailers by hand. They stood out, did all these different things. They repalletized everything with all the 100 trucks that we organized and picked and packed, there's a order system that was created so that schools could seamlessly place an order, have their orders delivered directly to their schools at 
a schedule of date and time so that they didn't have to worry about those things. But all of those things happened very quietly behind the scenes with it. When we have an inventory tracking sheet that was created by her friends in finance, we could track everything, but we were just, we were staggered when we actually looked at the final numbers as to the volumes of material that came in and have gone out the door. And that's due to the extended and concerted effort of the people from the purchasing team. So again, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you to the team. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for letting us know about all of the hard work that your team and yourself did. Your team has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure everyone had access to everything that they needed in this changing environment. You have enabled the Halton District School Board to keep the wheels turning, and we really value and appreciate everything that you and your team have done. Thank you so much, and again, thank you so much for expanding on sort of the Inspire Award recipients. We really do appreciate it. And you are welcome to stay if you'd like. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Manager Bennett. And we are now up to items 3.0 and 4.0, the consent agenda for approval and information, which include the minutes from March the 23rd, as well as the order paper. Trustee Amos, would you like to make a motion to deal with the consent agenda items? Yes, I would. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And Trustee Garrett, would you like to second that motion? Yes, I would, thank you. Wonderful, I'm gonna put the motion on the floor. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the consent agenda action and information items and for April the 6th, 2022. Are there any items from this list that need to be pulled for discussion? Seeing none. Are there any objections to approving the consent agenda? Wonderful. So by unanimous consent, the consent agenda is approved. We are now up to item 5.0, ratification and action items, starting with business transaction in transacted in private session. Vice Chair Harrison, do we have any business from private session that requires approval? Yes, we do. Uh, there's one item and through you, Madam Chair, uh, be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the resolution from the Halton District School Board meeting in private session, April 6, 2022, respecting property matters, report 22051 and I so move. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Trustee Collard? Would you like yes, to thank you. Wonderful. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Is there any debate? Seeing none, if I can ask you to all go over to your voting sheets and cast your vote, please. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, we are now up to items 5.2, which are items for action for April the 6th, which is today, which we have two of. First off, we have item 5.2.1, trustee expense governance procedure, report number 22044. Uh, I will read the motion and then see if anybody has anything they'd like to speak to. Be it resolved, the trustee expense governance procedure as appended to report 22044 be approved. So, Trustee Collard, would you like to move this? Yes, please. Wonderful. And Trustee Rocha, would you like to second it? I would. Wonderful. Would either of you like to speak to this motion? But since this mo a motion came uh, last meeting as well, 
um, and there were no questions. I don't think it requires any further explanation. Thanks. All right, thank you. Is there any debate regarding this motion? Wonderful. Seeing none, if again, you can pop on over to your voting sheets and cast your vote, please. And that carries unanimously. Thank you so much. All right, we are now up to item 5.2.2, funding request, funding request regarding the learning resource teacher funding. Report number 22048, brought by Trustee Kubetz. So I'm gonna read the motion and then I'm gonna pass it over to you, Trustee Kubetz, to speak to it. So be it resolved that the chair write a letter to the Minister of Education Request, re requesting an increase in funding for the 2022-2023 school year for the purpose of hiring additional learning resource teachers to provide targeted support directly to students to close the unprecedented learning gaps in early literacy and numeracy that have widened through two years of disrupted learning during the pandemic. Trustee Gobanz, would you like to move this? Yes, I would. Thank you. And Trustee Gray, would you like to second it? Yes, I would. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Trustee Grabantz, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is uh, basically a follow-up to the discussion we had uh, at the last board meeting. Uh, Superintendent Proto uh, brought information about uh, the, the very tough decision to uh, remove elementary teacher librarians uh, it, and um, really it, it feels like we're um, uh, we, we are we are under we are under resourced for what has happened over the past two years um, we really need adequate funding to directly, address the learning gaps that have grown. Uh, our staff have identified um, learning gaps uh, that, um, and many uh, that are, are, are larger than, than normal. And that's why we had to make that decision. And we shouldn't have to make that decision. Uh, we, the government really should be sub truly supporting us and supporting our students and our families uh, so that we can get everybody on track and heading for uh, success. Right now, we have had to, but it, it seems we've had to um, target our resources to uh, help the few that are in need, and that is so appropriate, but by losing the teacher librarians in elementary, we are, um, we are unfortunately taking away from the, from the many. Uh, so, and, and that, that shouldn't be happening. Um, the, uh, they are a valued position and uh, I would like to see them come back, but I would like to see both things happen next year if possible. And um, I, I think that a letter to the minister uh, outlining that, that the, uh, the money that uh, they've provided uh, is not addressing the gaps that have been identified and we need to be able to hire more learning resource teachers. Thank you so much. Uh, Superintendent Proto, I see you've popped on. I didn't know if you had anything to add to Trustee Grabentz's discussion. Uh, through the chair to Trustee Grabentz, I don't. That was incredibly articulate, captured all of the things that we've been talking about for many weeks now, and I really appreciate what you just said. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions from trustees? All right, awesome. Seeing none, uh, I would like everyone, if they could, go over to their voting sheets and cast your votes, please. All 
Wonderful. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Trustee Gravans, I will look to you for support in crafting this letter. I appreciate, I always appreciate all the help I can get. Vice Chair Al Harrison. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm late to the table here. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that hours and hours and hours are spent writing these letters and I frankly can't remember the last time that we received a response. Um, each of the issues that's been raised have been kind of critical enough to student and staff achievement and well-being that these motions have come to the table and these letters have been written. And, you know, we're coming into a budget cycle that may or may not see other such decisions, tough decisions with trade-offs being made. And so I just, it would be great for one of the authors yourself to loop back just to let people know what letters, if any, receive response and for then us as trustees to figure out what the next step is in terms of our advocacy beyond the board on on some of these things so it's about this topic but it's also about the other 50 topics that we need to be kind of pushing on beyond our our boundaries so thank you Thank you, Vice Chair Harrison, and I do agree. I do think we also need to look at those other avenues of communication that we have. So <laughs> sadly, as even speaking with other chairs, it is rare to get responses from the Minister of Education. So sometimes maybe it's even advocating at our local level, um, having those, those conversations with our MPPs and looking at how they also can advocate, us, advocate for us to the Minister of Education. So I appreciate that insight, Vice Chair Harrison. Thank you so much. Okay, we are moving along tonight. So we are now up to item 6.0, which is communications to the board. And first off, another wonderful part of my evening, we have the student trustee report. Uh, trustee Vigilankara and Trustee Bao, do you have a report for us this evening? Yes, we do. Wonderful. Um, would you like to go ahead and let us know what you've got to say, please? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'd like to begin with some student senate updates. As many of you know, this month is Ramadan and many Muslim students across our board are currently observing this religious occasion. We want to accommodate these students, so we moved our April student senate meeting that took place yesterday earlier and we cut it down from three hours to two hours from 5 to 7 p.m. so that our senators could have the opportunity to break their fast on time. On Monday, we had our very first Indigenous Rights Student Senate subcommittee, subcommittee meeting with instructional program leader of Indigenous education, Tarmi Hardwick, Indigenous education resource teacher, Tamara Phillips, interneurant uh, resource teacher, Christine Vanderwall, and Superintendent Etoff, along with several members of our Student Senate. We were able to come together and discuss the direction of the subcommittee and its goals and plan for future meetings. One key takeaway from the meeting was that students wish to amplify Indigenous voices and learn and educate themselves. We are also hoping to have more students who self-identify as Indigenous on our subcommittee, as we recognize that in order to have these important conversations, we must have Indigenous representation in the dialogue. Last Thursday, Trustee Winnelin Carr and I joined with System Principal Shalita Walker and Student Senator Garisha Sani had the opportunity to get student consultation for the HSB Student Equity Committee, and we presented our draft proposal recommendations. We were able to gather more student input from various groups and consider how we are going to reach out to those students and get representation from many groups. We are having this sub, uh, sorry, we're having this committee proposal shared with the wider student body soon and asking for interested students to put forth their names and join the planning committee. Now I'll pass it on to Trustee Vinland Cara. Thank you. Uh, so today we had a meeting with our trustee mentors, staff advisors, and associate director Bogue to discuss the possibility of having hybrid student senate meetings, um, as well as a couple other senate initiatives run in this hybrid model where we have both the in-person and virtual elements. 
Um, our senators have not had the opportunity to meet in person since February of 2020. So you can imagine that many of them are eager to see each other and work together in person. Um, we also know that there are senators and families who are not yet comfortable returning to the in-person model. And so uh, we definitely want to exercise a lot of precautions and give senators the option of joining remotely or joining at the, at the either the board uh, office or another location. Um, and trustee, so Trustee Bao and I will be seeking senator and staff feedback as we move forward with these changes and we'll keep uh, the board updated on, on our final decisions. We also wanted to provide a brief update about our motion regarding student trustees ability to move and second motions. Um, as you know, this was an OSTA initiative that we had presented to all of you at our last committee of the whole meeting in March. Um, and at our next board meeting in April, we hope to bring forward a motion pertaining to this. And as promised, we'll be sure to consider trustee feedback as we develop our motion and report. Lastly, we are planning on hosting an additional student senate meeting later this month in order to continue planning for HYLS. As always, senior staff and trustees are welcome to attend and an invitation to all of you will be sent out. Thank you all, and we are happy to take any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, do anybody have, does anyone have any questions for our student trustees? So I have one. So I was able to pop into your meeting briefly last night to, to sort of, I heard a lot about what you were doing as far as HYLS was concerned. And I know part of the discussion again was similar to what you were speaking of with your back to in-person learning. So with HYLS, uh, are you looking at moving forward hybrid or in-person or remote or have you come to a decision on that yet? I don't know if Trustee Bao said that and I've just missed it. <laughs> I, I think uh, Trustee Villancar briefly mentioned that, but we are hoping, fingers crossed, that we can have some type of hybrid model. We haven't had anything finally decided yet, but that's what we're hoping for. All right, awesome. I, I know you had mentioned Student Senate, but I didn't know, did I hear, miss HYLS as well? No, Sorry. no absolutely. That, so that was definitely something we discussed. It, it's harder to get HYLS in person, considering um, that it's not just our senators that would be there. It would, it would be uh, students from across the board that are not on Senate and it's not held in school like a board school it, it would or the board office it, it, it would likely be held um, at a location like Sheridan which in the past it's been held at uh, the Sheridan College in, in Oakville so that's a bit more complex we also do have um, we mentioned at our last meeting the Northern Forum which is intended to be for students who live either in Halton Hills or Milton um, and it's kind of an accessibility and awareness project so Hopefully that initiative might be able to also be hybrid like our Senate meetings, but as for HYLS, we're not certain yet, but it, it will likely be fully online. But we, we haven't come to a final decision. Great, great. Thank you so much. Anyone else have any questions for the trustees? Director Ennis, did you just pop on to support or did you have anything you wanted to ask the student trustees? Oh, it's gone. <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe it's my internet. I was always on, but. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Harrison. Thank you. Uh, yes, through you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is about the motion that will be coming forward regarding um, trustee putting motions forward and or seconding motions. And as you mentioned, this is a provincial uh, or a, an initiative that's taking place across the province. And when the motion comes forward, it would be really interesting to know um, how it's being received in other jurisdictions as well. So I have seen some of the letters that have been written to the minister. I think we've seen two of them. Uh, so far, but I'm just kind of wondering kind of what that big picture looks like. Because I'm imagining that a, kind of a, a, a global change would be easier for um, student trustees across the province kind of thing as opposed to like the board by board piece and it would be great to see what the momentum is like. 
that's why I'm asking. Thank you. I know Trustee Bao has been working, a, sorry, through the chair. I know Trustee Bao has been working on this a lot um, and, and is in touch with Asta um, and is heavily involved in Asta. So I'll maybe pass this question on to her and then I can add on. If you need. Yeah, so uh, feel free to add on. But I think the hope is just that each of our boards can show our support in this initiative and hopefully that can spark some change in actually uh, like, being a student trustees being able to actually move and second their own motions. So that's what I've been hearing. And so far we've seen the two letters. I will keep uh, the board updated if we see any more from other boards. Great, thank you very much. Anything else? I'll give a couple of seconds. I know the internet seems to be not necessarily everybody's friend tonight, so just making sure before we move on. Uh, just to maybe add on, I uh, I take your point through the chair uh, to Trustee L. Harrison about the sort of idea for a, a global change through AUSTA. Um, so we can certainly uh, let the people at AUSTA, the student trustees at AUSTA who are leading this initiative know um, to maybe also advocate um, as an organization so it's not just the board by board sort of advocacy and we have more of a united front. I think that's a, a good point. Great, thank you so much. All right, we are now up to item 6.2. As per our bylaws, many items coming to the board for decision will need to come to the board more than one time. The first time for information and the second time for consideration for approval. This gives both the board and the public time to consider these items. And tonight we have one item that fits that criteria, uh, report number 22049, board bylaws, uh, presented by Trustee Collard and Trustee Rocha. Would either of you like to speak to this? Oh, through the chair, um, Trustee Collard was going to speak to this, but I'm assuming she's having connection issues. Um, so I'll speak on her behalf until she uh, is able to reconnect. Um, the report presented this evening um, has was originally shared uh, back at the March Committee of the Whole. Uh, based on some feedback from various uh, trustees and groups that wanted to see some changes in the bylaws. And it was also time to refresh our bylaws. So the report that you see is the proposed uh, version of the bylaws. In the report, it outlines the changes. And uh, what I want to mention is that the bylaws will be discussed in more detail at next week's Committee of the Whole. And our hope is after next week's Committee of the Whole, we can then send it to legal for review. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Amos. Thank you, uh, through you. Um, I have some concerns about this report coming to board at this time because while I um, do remember um, having some conversations, I didn't believe we were finished having those conversations because there are um, items in the report such as the agenda and items like that which have been totally changed which were not part of the discussions that we had at Committee of the Whole. And I also am a little concerned about the timelines because um, I do not believe that um, if the time between the committee of the whole um, and the next board meeting would be enough to have a lawyer's opinion on it. I believe it needs to come back to committee of the whole before it actually gets to um, here at the board because I feel that 
Um, trustees need to have more discussion before it comes here. I feel this is premature. Trustee Rocha, would you like to respond? Uh, sure. So the intent was to discuss this again at Committee of the Whole next week. Um, and only based on next week's conversations would we then send it to, to legal for approval. So we wouldn't be sending it to legal without um, the trustees agreeing on, on the changes. And the other thing, as far as um, having legal come back on that date, if legal isn't ready, we are ready to, to defer it to a later date. Can I follow up? Um, I don't feel that the document should be here though without having had that sober second thought or that conversation with trustees because um, to put a document on the board report, it looks like it's finished. And at this time, you yourself have even said it's not finished because trustees are still going to be um, discussing it. So um, I believe that this needs to be withdrawn and um, it needs to go back to committee of the whole before it can even appear here as the first time, because I know it has to come here twice and that may be why it's here now, but I feel it is very premature. It, um, we cannot be having something that hasn't really had the opportunity to have all trustees have a real discussion on um, come back the second time, maybe totally changed. I don't feel that's fair to the public or to trustees. Thank you. Can I respond? Yes, you may. Okay, so um, just to address some of the concerns, we, we did originally share it and discuss it at Committee of the Whole, and a follow-up was sent to all trustees to provide feedback. Um, we did hear back uh, from some, not all, but that's not unusual. Um, so we did give trustees an opportunity to provide feedback. Um, so, and again, there will be feedback again next week, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to listen and see what else other trustees have to say. Thank you. Trustee Danielli. Thank you. I'm going to wade into this rather hesitantly. Um, I'm in agreement with Trustee Amos. I was under the impression this was coming back to another committee, the whole. So I was quite surprised to see it on a board agenda tonight. Um, you may have sent something out for feedback and I apologize. We get so much all the time that I missed it. And I'm not really sure that's an appropriate way to get feedback. I think bringing it back to committee the whole next, withdrawing it now, bringing it back to committee the whole next week, and then making sure that we all have an understanding, we've all had that opportunity, and then bringing it to the board. I think some really, really good work is being done here, uh, but I do think that we're going to end up pulling it apart of the table if we don't go through a more thoughtful, more methodical process. I do think it is premature to be at the board table tonight, and I look forward to having the opportunity to discuss it further, but I, I do not think that that time is tonight, unfortunately. And I do apologize because I know that Jeff is going to put this in one May I make a point of order, please? Uh, go ahead, Trusty Collar. Uh, yeah, this isn't up for a vote tonight, so there's nothing to withdraw. Um, we, were, we are bringing it to committee of the whole next week. There will be further discussion. If the further discussion warrants further work, then then it won't appear in the next board agenda. It's only here so that you can see the work that's been done to date. It gives you a whole week before committee of the whole to digest it and have your questions ready. And I thank you for that. It does say um, for action on April 20th. Um, so I would prefer to see April 20th being the first look at it and then for action in May. Again, I do believe that this is premature and I believe that to continue discussing it tonight um, is not really the most appropriate way that we would be better off doing that next week at Committee of the Whole. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Danielli. Uh, Trustee Amos. Thank you, through you. Um, um, also, um, 
there needs to be a motion made um, that would come to board for anything to be go to a lawyer. So um, we cannot just go from committee of the whole to the lawyer because a motion has to be made because the board has to direct the action of the um, document to go to lawyer. We can't just send it there. So um, there's also a missing step in this process. So um, I know as, um, I'm probably um, not very popular right now, but I just, I feel that this should be at, still at Committee of the Whole, as Trustee Danielli said, and I believe there's a lot more conversation that needs to be had on it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Amos. Um, I did have to say, I did, I was worried a little bit about, again, as Trustee Amos pointed out, the timeline to legal. Um, because as Trustee Amos pointed out, that needs to be a decision that comes from board. And then I don't know that in a week is really enough time. I know Trustee Roshi, you said that you'll wait ahead of time, but that's part, not part of the background. So that just kind of worries me a tiny bit. So um, I think, again, we'll have a more fruitful discussion at Committee of the Whole to look at where we're going um, and see where we fall following that. But thank you very much for bringing this to the table this evening. Okay, we are now up to item 6.3.1, which is an information report from Superintendent Nagoy. Um, the budget survey report number 22050. Superintendent, Superintendent Nagoy, as Dave Bennett said yesterday, you were earlier today, you're always with the numbers, so I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you. We are nowhere near the million dollar or the million number count uh, mark uh, in terms of our budget survey responses, but we do have uh, about uh, 1,300 responses to, to this survey, and we wanted to thank uh, our um, community of, and staff and students for taking the time to go over. It was a little more lengthy than our usual surveys. Uh, the uh, budget survey was uh, available between February 18th and March 7th and uh, was promoted both on our website, social media, uh, as well as with, with the Student Senate, uh, the Special Education Advisory Committee and Parent Involvement Committee. Um, as you will see in the appended report, uh, there are uh, more detailed findings with regards to the questions and additional comments. Uh, the overall uh, re board report only has some of the highlights, and I wanted to take a little bit of time to walk you through some of these. We will take these up again as we discuss at the Committee of the Whole, the update to budget, uh, where we are, and uh, what are some of the areas that we are uh, proposing for next year. And we will be linking those to uh, the feedback that we've received, to the discussions that we've had with trustees and the senior staff. So with regards to the budget survey, we have a number of questions. The first uh, five relate to the five strategic priorities and what are some of the investments or areas of interest uh, for our respondents uh, and uh, the um, with, with regards to the equity and inclusion area, the top uh, priorities were uh, with regards to continuing to support uh, staff to address areas of underperformance um, across our system, so coaches um, and uh, teaching uh, staff that support our, our students, as well as uh, uh, more awareness uh, and leadership sessions for students, so more hands-on opportunities for our students. In terms of some of the other uh, questions or uh, areas of priority, uh, we have seen uh, quite a bit in terms of the access to programming as well as access to the um, facility, the learning environment, whether it's outdoor or indoor facility and the investments um, for our aging uh, schools as being one of the top priorities to continue to invest in. Uh, looking uh, to resources, um, there was uh, a number of comments that have been themed in terms of providing additional devices or technology for students, as well as uh, resources uh, 
to support learning. So not, not staffing, but learning resources to support uh, student, uh, um, students' achievement. Um, there were additional comments with regards to uh, allocating resources to uh, whether it's early intervention or literacy and numeracy, uh, focusing on uh, equity in terms of resources that are within our curriculum and libraries and uh, the hiring additional um, racialized um, staff within our staff and system leaders. From a lens of mental health and well-being, the top areas that uh, have been identified were uh, investing in supports that work with our students directly, such as social workers, child and youth counselors, and other professional staff. Uh, there was uh, also a, a few comments that were in um, support of additional well-being sessions that uh, are aimed both at students and staff, so support for staff as well when it comes to mental health and well-being. Uh, in terms of uh, additional um, uh, comments, uh, there were some uh, comments with regards to more investments in parent engagement and awareness of parents in terms of early signs um, to be aware of and working with students uh, and the uh, increased extracurricular offerings and programs that uh, are known to benefit students' uh, well-being and mental health. From uh, a length of learning and achievement, uh, the top areas uh, were with regards to early intervention and learning recovery resources and support for students. Uh, especially given the um, impact uh, in terms of uh, learning gaps um, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so re-engagement supports, uh, as well as uh, guidance counselors, coaches, and additional uh, tutors uh, were some of the comments that uh, were repeated uh, in this section of our uh, budget survey. Uh, from a program perspective, uh, the access to certain programs, the availability within the various uh, areas within our board, uh, were a, a focus as well as differentiated instruction uh, where needed. And uh, supporting uh, schools with additional learning resources, library, sports equipment, and technology was um, another key theme. Environmental leadership uh, area had uh, as top priorities the investment in outdoor. Uh, learning spaces and uh, the investment in school renewal uh, to have a uh, environmental sustainability lens. Uh, from the comments, we do see quite uh, a few comments that are um, looking at programs for more hands-on experience of students uh, to collaborate with various uh, organizations, agencies, indigenous communities to advance uh, their learning and awareness in protecting the environment, in learning about food production and pollution controls and other course offerings uh, that are around this uh, topic. And of course, in terms of transportation, there have been uh, a few comments with regards to um, uh, providing uh, public transportation and public passes, which our board does provide. So perhaps we need to work a little bit more in terms of the availability of some of those uh, areas uh, that we provide to our students, uh, in particular for secondary students. And green initiatives, uh, whether it's carpooling or electric uh, car uh, stations and uh, public transit, uh, promoting public transit. From a lens of uh, Indigenous perspectives and awareness, the uh, top areas uh, that have been identified by the respondents include, again, the, the hands-on experience of so the classroom visits with Indigenous leads and elders and, and members of the community to provide an authentic perspective and learning opportunities uh, for students. Uh, and as well as staff, so professional learning to raise awareness and the impact of colonialism and anti-Indigenous uh, racism. 
uh, when we look at the other comments and program, again, they do um, uh, revolve around that hands-on experience and uh, bringing back some of the extracurricular activities that uh, would provide uh, our students with such opportunities. Uh, from a staffing perspective, looking at hiring additional Indigenous leads and resources to support Indigenous education. Uh, question number seven uh, was looking at the COVID investments uh, that we've had uh, this past year and looking at what would be some of the areas of priorities as we navigate next year. Uh, at the top was ventilation and air filtration in the classroom, followed by mental health supports and recognizing that investment in outdoor education continues to be an, uh, a priority for our students and uh, parents uh, and community. With regards to other comments, in terms of maintaining protocols or, or eliminating protocols, there have been uh, themed comments on both sides. Um, and uh, with regards to learning renewal, is um, the comments were around the learning loss as a result of the pandemic uh, lockdowns and the need to continue to provide resources to support students uh, and uh, continue to have the flexibility uh, through virtual learning uh, in the year to come. So we've had uh, thousands of comments um, in, in the budget survey. Um, we've themed them here uh, with the big thanks from uh, our research department. Uh, and we are looking at all of them in detail as we're going through the budget process. Uh, and we, as we are aligning, uh, aligning our resources to our strategic plan, as well as to some of the areas of priority that we see in the system as we come out of this pandemic. I'd be happy to take any questions trustees may have. And again, we will be uh, mentioning these again at the Committee of the Whole when we have our discussion around the budget and where we are uh, in terms of uh, some of the resources and the position that we have currently. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Superintendent McGoy? Uh, Vice Carol Harrison. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, lots of great uh, feedback and uh, information presented here. My concern with all of this feedback is I wonder what our ability is to honor the priorities that have been, uh, have come through in the context that we're dealing with, um, uh, not only this year, but in the past few years, we have had to make some very difficult decisions. So. I think it would also be useful as a dimension to the input that we collect on our budgets to get some feedback in terms of trade-offs because for the 10 plus percent of people that took the time to write things in, 99% of those responses were, and you need to hire more staff or buy more of this or do more of that. and. If we have a status quo budget that comes at a cost from somewhere else. And so those are, and we're already seeing those things come forward through uh, decisions that are being envisioned or, or made. And so I just, I hope we can somehow bring the community along maybe in a more nuanced way in terms of those um, those trade-offs that we need to make. It can't always be more because we don't have more. We have less. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's gonna be very difficult. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a question or a, a comment, maybe a little bit of both. That, that is a uh, very well laid out um, 
reality uh, situation that we're in. Yes, it is a, a status quo budget. Um, we do have um, some additional COVID funding that has been announced, some additional tutoring funding that has been announced and that has been uh, much appreciated. And we are working with that to maximize the areas that we can support and continue to invest in and make the biggest uh, difference in the system. Um, overall, compared to this year, yes, there's a, a little bit less funding uh, as some of the areas were not continued. Um, well, I shouldn't say necessarily less because there has been also um, some new funding uh, uh, announced, such as the tutoring funding and learning, uh, targeting the learning gaps, um, which is timed uh, investment uh, for, for our uh, district. Um, but it is a trade-off. It always will be a trade-off. Investing more in one area will come at the trade-off by investing less in another area. So um, our job as uh, you know, the board of trustees and the senior team is uh, identifying those areas of priority that we need to invest additional resources in uh, and those areas that are going to be um, having a little bit of, of a trade-off, maybe the that uh, will get a bit less investment. Uh, in looking at the comments, a lot of the areas that I see are things that we are uh, contemplating. Uh, will they be at the level of support that uh, our respondents expect? That that will be hard to match uh, given, you know, we have about 66,000 students uh, in our care. Uh, and limited resources, but we're certainly focusing on, uh, you know, we've heard areas of uh, equity and inclusion, both in terms of space, the learning space, the programming, um, uh, as well as resources to support learning, to support learning gaps. So we've we, we've taken that feedback and we're working with it in, in terms of allocating resources and the funding that gets announced. We also use this feedback when we go with provincial tables in order to identify the areas. Here's the challenges we have. We would like to do more in this area and we would request that there's additional funding. And sometimes we, we receive that funding in year. Um, and uh, I think there's merit uh, for the respondents of these surveys, because we use this feedback to provide it to the ministry to inform them of the situation on the ground. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, thank you so much, Superintendent Nagoy. I know these are some very difficult decisions that have to be made and trade-offs that have to be seen. Um, I look forward to seeing how we use this information to, to inform the decisions that we make. Um, and again, I think some of this information, Trustee Grabentz, might be valuable in the letter that we're looking at writing. So thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Nagoy. We appreciate the information. Okay, we are now up to item 6.4. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, Director Ennis, we are now up to your report. So as of right now, I have three items, ministry funding, in memorandum, or in memoriam, and other. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. And good evening once again, everyone. I uh, would just like to um, uh, change, switch the order a little bit. Um, and I'm going to do the uh, in memoriam first. Uh, Trustees, staff, and public, I would just like to say that um, we've come to the decision that we would like to take uh, an opportunity to honor the staff members who have served us uh, for many years, sometimes for decades, and uh, they've given their lives and their service to the board. And we believe that it is totally appropriate to pay tribute and to honor them for their sacrifice and for their service and for their commitment to impacting and influencing thousands of lives over their careers. We believe that uh, when they're gone, uh, their memory lives on, and uh, we would like their families and the public to know that we truly appreciated them for everything they have done. So it is with our deepest condolences to the families, uh, both the, the families of the 
uh, deceased and the school community family that we offer our deepest condolences to everyone. And we trust that the memories that they shared will sustain them through these very difficult times. As we heard earlier tonight, we know that they are sorely missed um, whatever role they played in our board. So the names are uh, Joyce Donatelli, a teacher at TA Blakelock, Richard Jones, teacher at Ethel Gardner, Greg Shanks, teacher at TA Blakelock, Kingsley Lachance, head caretaker at Robert Bateman, Nada Smith, teacher at Orchard Park, Stephanie Dushko, teacher at Frank J. Hayden. And so I would ask if you would join me please in a 60 seconds of uh, silence uh, for these uh, dearly departed. Thank you for honoring their memories and for all that they've done for the Halton District School Board. And with that, I'm going to then ask uh, Superintendent Nagoy to speak to us about some ministry, further ministry funding. Thank you. Um, I'm probably going to start it off uh, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, Superintendent uh, Salmini may want to uh, join. Uh, we have received additional funding. I was alluding at a little earlier uh, with regards to tutoring, uh, tutoring supports for uh, our students. Uh, it has come in two parts. So in total, it's 5.7 million uh, to be spent from April 1st to December 31st, 2022. It is a significant amount of money that we are thrilled to have. Uh, the timing, however, is a little short as we are trying to allocate and, and put in place uh, the programs and the resources in order to support the students. And we recognize that uh, learning recovery is a journey, is a commitment, uh, and it, it will not end uh, on December 31st. So one of our challenges as we're building the budget next year is to look at how can we support um, the level of learning recovery or what level of learning recovery uh, past January 2023. Um, and with that, perhaps I will pass it on to my colleague, uh, Superintendent Salmini, to talk to you a little bit about some of the programs that we are uh, looking at putting in place to make the best use of this additional funding that is available to our system. Thank you, Superintendent Nagoy. Uh, yes, we are very excited about the funding and it comes with some challenges in terms of uh, timing, but we really want to maximize the resource and, and make as many things happen for students as possible. So we are uh, planning to provide opportunities both during the school day and outside of the school day uh, for students. Um, uh, some of the funding will be used to provide increased opportunities for small group instruction during the school day uh, in our elementary schools. And as you know, we do have uh, additional staffing in our schools um, this year to support um, some of the um, absences in those pieces, but we are training some of those teachers that have been hired uh, to be also instructional resource teachers so that they will be able to take um, small groups um, for learning both in literacy mainly but also in mathematics as, as needed. We also have a number of programs planned for outside of the school day um, for both the spring, the coming spring, and for the summer that will be uh, funded from, uh, from this money. Um, it'll also be used for some secondary students to augment the programs that we already have offered in Halton District School Board by Gary Allen Learning Centre. So much of our outside of this school day uh, programs uh, come from um, uh, 
another funding source, but uh, for example, we are looking at add adding tutors in our existing summer school classes uh, with this funding so that there could be more opportunities for a smaller group interaction and instruction in, uh, in that learning. A portion of the funding will also be used to engage community organizations. Uh, in providing supports for students. And so we have already invited uh, partners that have existing relationships with our board um, and we'll be going through a process for uh, selecting uh, those partnerships to help um, uh, provide opportunities for our kids. Our Welcome Centre is also organizing a mentoring opportunity for our newcomer students uh, for spring and possibly for the summer. So those are just some examples of, of the things that we are looking to do both in the spring and the summer, and then looking into uh, next year to continue some of, the, of, of this work um, and really trying to uh, be able to um, add to during the day, you know, if we have opportunities to have uh, staff that can assist with uh, intervention during the day uh, with students. Um, Having said all of that, this is contingent upon having staff that are uh, willing and, and, and able um, to take on this work. And so we really are um, working to promote all of these programs uh, and opportunities in our schools and to inspire people uh, to, to do it because we know that our staff uh, are also uh, very tired and um, uh, have, have had a challenge. And so these, this is in addition to and beyond their day. So we really uh, are working to secure as many people as possible so that we can offer programming in as many schools as possible. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Trustee Grubens. Uh, through the chair. Um, thank you very much for this information. Um, <clears throat> I find uh, looking uh, into this a little bit, I find it very interesting that we have to spend 15% a, a of the funding on community partnerships offering tutoring opportunities. Uh, so we're funding external partners with public funds. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, as part of our transfer payment agreement, uh, it is does stipulate that we have to use at a minimum 15% uh, of the funding um, outside of the administration portion. So uh, about uh, 405, 410,000 is the minimum to be allocated uh, between April 1st and August 31st to external partners. And again, the same amount between September 1st and December 31st. Uh, the funding is, is structured in two stages. So there's a, a transfer payment for the first stage. Uh, and I would assume uh, it would be similar in the second one. However, uh, I haven't seen the transfer payment agreement for the second tranche of the money. Just a, a follow up. Um, so what, what is considered a community partnership? I just want to kind of clear that up. Um, it is, a, I think, a very flexible term uh, looking at uh, organizations that can provide uh, tutoring support. And uh, in the agreement, it does mention what uh, could be uh, the background of a tutor. So it does not have to be uh, a teacher. Uh, it can be uh, a student, a university student, a high school student. It could be different uh, other uh, professions um, that could qualify as a tutor. So organizations that have staff uh, that provide certain um, programs currently uh, could uh, be considered to provide after school um, or uh, weekends or during the summer, uh, additional tutoring opportunities for our students. And I see my colleagues are on the screen. They, they have a bit more information on the partners that we are targeting at this, uh, at this moment. Thank you uh, through the uh, chair to Trustee Gabrantz. Um, we have uh, recently uh, invited our uh, known uh, partners, our known organizations that we work with. So those that we have an existing MOU, uh, those that we have already a close uh, working service relationship uh, and our SIAC uh, associations. So given the very short timeline for the uh, first uh, pot of money. Uh, we've decided to go with those organizations that we know. 
uh, for the September to December a pot of money. We are looking to cast the net a little bit wider. And for that, we are working uh, with purchasing for uh, an RFP to go out uh, so that we can invite um, other partners that we don't know about the community uh, to share in this work. It does stipulate in the uh, TPA that uh, we cannot uh, provide the funding to for-profit uh, organizations. So we are focused on uh, our non, uh, not-for-profit um, organizations uh, within our community. Go ahead, Trustee Rebens. Uh, yeah, um, with regard, thank you, Cherith. Um, with regard to how this tutoring takes place and who is um, qualified, uh, you know, are there any kind of stipulations on, um, I guess, I just want to be sure, you know, vulnerable sector screenings, um, that there's always the safety in mind uh, as well. Um, it just seems so nebulous to have this term of community partners um, and to uh, and and for spaces are is it supposed to be happening within our facilities outside our facilities you know what what's that looking like uh, so the uh, those who are selected through the review process by uh, a team of staff will be required to sign an MOU. Uh, in that MOU, it will require, just as it details in the uh, call for applications, that they are to require uh, to follow all of the safety protocols, including the um, uh, the uh, screening requirements, um, and uh, it, it is to be provided on their own sites, or they may enter into a rental agreement with the board. Uh, just as any uh, third party provider can do so. So uh, it's not to access our sites um, and under our supervision, it's uh, under their own supervision and a rental agreement if it's on our site. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Harrison. Thank you, uh, three Madam Chair. It's, for me, it, it's great to hear uh, that that piece will be in essence, supporting not-for-profits in our community that work with, oftentimes work with students uh, in our board in other capacities. I'm thinking about the organizations that sit on SEAC, for example, and some of the wonderful um, programs that they're currently offering. So my question is about the kind of the supply and demand piece of this, and will they, the organizations have to be creating something new that speaks to this, the requirements here. Uh, and will students have, like, will there be more than one opportunity for, say, there's a student that has a certain, they're in a grade <laughs> and they have a certain profile and need and all of that. And do you anticipate that they'll have choices or, um, like, what's our responsibility then to these external organizations? Do we have to fill up our own first and then how does that all work or do we know that yet? Uh, th through the, the chair device, uh, Chair L. Harrison. Uh, certainly that is something that we're thinking about because uh, there are only so many students who will be interested in, uh, in tutoring opportunities and we wanna make sure that we're really not competing for uh, the same students to participate in the breadth of program. Uh, so we will be looking at um, the summer offerings that will be designed through special education services and how can we complement uh, the offerings that are being provided by the selected recipients uh, through the tutoring dollars so that uh, we, you know, we're, we're, we're not, as I say, we're not competing and uh, and that there's a breadth of opportunities for students to choose from. So, I, you know, it's hard to predict at this point um, how many applications we will receive, uh, but I do anticipate that from SEAC in particular, that there will be a few associations that uh, uh, will be able to use their existing programs and possibly also be interested in uh, designing some, some new programs to target the, um, the areas that are identified 
um, in uh, this opportunity, specifically literacy, numeracy, and other uh, foundational skills. Um, so we'll see when those proposals come in and uh, then we'll look as a, as a special education services team to see how we need to adjust our summer offerings uh, to complement those. Thank you. Any more questions? I do have one. So, oh, sorry, Vice Chair Harrison, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, mine is more a comment just globally that there's a, a trend here that we're seeing in terms of the internal external pieces that are coming out of the ministry and on one hand, it seems really problematic. We had the discussion about, you know, medical professionals delegating medical procedures to our staff, to HDSB staff. And now we're having a discussion about partnering with external agencies to uh, deliver tutoring, which is another new avenue and I just I'm really aware of kind of that global piece and just wondering uh, where this is all where this is all leading <laughs> particularly as we look at you know under resourcing in some areas of our existing responsibilities and uh, yeah it's just a problem for me philosophically how all of these things are happening seemingly at one time. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I, I'd like to echo that from you, Vice Chair Harrison. It's that outsourcing piece. You know, we saw TVO back when they looked at the online learning, and now there's tutors from outside of our organization. I am wondering, um, Superintendent Reddick, what will the um, so you spoke about the selection criteria, selection of outside agencies to come in. How will we determine the students that will be allowed to or be eligible for these tutoring services? Is it that learning recovery pre piece or is it, hey, a tutor sounds like a great idea for my child? Uh, through the chair to the chair, um, you know, ultimately, I think the the who will be eligible will be driven by the offering. Uh, and so we want to make sure that our opportunities are really open to uh, as many students uh, who would like to seek the um, uh, supports, uh, whether it's uh, the supports that are offered by the school board or whether they are the supports that are offered by one of our community uh, organizations. Um, but really, you know, the who will be driven uh, by that particular offering. We will support uh, the organizations in promoting their, um, uh, their offerings to our community and, and support our parents in, uh, in making sure that they're selecting the right opportunity for their child. But, uh, but ultimately, as I say, the, the criteria of who will get in will be driven by the opportunity. All right, thank you very much. Are there any further questions for Trustee Reddick and her team, or sorry, Superintendent Reddick and her team? <laughs> All right, thank you so much for that information. Uh, Director Ennis, back to you. Thank you so much, Chair Shuttleworth. And I uh, just wanted to update a couple of other items. I'm not sure how many of you had the opportunity to catch the director panel series last week. We had a series on uh, two-spirit and transgender awareness. And uh, I can tell you the conversation was very, very, at a very high level, uh, very informative. And our students who once again shun on the panel. Uh, so if you uh, haven't had an opportunity to catch one of these yet that we have been using to highlight our commitment to human rights and equity. Uh, I would encourage you to do so. We have one coming up at the end of this month, April 26, on Indigenous awareness. So stay tuned for more information on that one. And as you know, we have done Black excellence, we've done anti-Semitism, and uh, we have uh, Islamophobia coming up as well as Indigenous awareness. So uh, we are hopeful that uh, this will spur the conversation 
across our board in addition to the great work that's been done through our Equity and Human Rights Department, Dr. Jula Moore and her work, Rob Etoff and his team, and all of us uh, working together to support all our students to create uh, an environment of kindness, of inclusion, of belonging for every single student and family within the Halton District School Board. So um, thank you for your support on that. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Chair Shuttleworth, uh, through you, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, invite uh, members of the senior team to join me as we uh, recognize 33 solid years of service of Associate Director Bolg, who has recently submitted his uh, letter of retirement. And uh, David, uh, we just wanna thank you for everything that you have done for the Halton District School Board, uh, starting as a young teacher uh, to where you now the Associate Director. You have been a great partner of mine um, through these last few months. Being someone new to the board, I truly enjoyed working with you. And I know that the superintendents with whom you lead uh, they they truly appreciate you. So uh, with that, I would ask uh, Chair Shuttleworth and all the trustees to join me in just congratulating uh, Associate Director Bolg on, on, a, on a stellar career. Thank you. Trustee Reynolds, I think you might have some words. Yeah. Um, thank you, Associate Director, for your 33 years of service to the Halton community staff and students, and I'm sure this is gonna be a, a long, long list of goodbyes. Having known you for eight, over eight years, there are a number of things I certainly admire about you. Um, having attended SEAC meetings before becoming a trustee, I really admired your commitment to students with exceptionalities and the kindness and caring you showed their families. And I witnessed firsthand the admiration and respect you earned from the SEAC associations, which in itself is a tremendous honor and effort. I had the pleasure of working with you collaboratively uh, as your role as superintendent in Ward 1 schools. And I know that you took great joy in engaging and involving yourself at the school level. Um, and finally, as one of the student senate mentors, thank you for your commitment and leadership at student senate. And if I might, I'll just pass it on to my colleague, Trustee Oliver, um, who can elaborate. Thank you. Um, David, may you be proud of, of the work you have done, the person you are, and the difference you have made for the thousands of HDSB students. Here's to a healthy, wealthy, in all the ways that matter, long and very happy retirement. Congratulations, David. And I'll pass it on to Trustees Bell and Vidya Lankara. Thank you, Trustee Oliver. Uh, as you may know, I am new to this board. I, this is my first year as a student trustee and I've had the privilege to get to work with David. And I think I can speak for everyone that whenever uh, Mr. Vogue joins any student Senate meeting, students are so excited to hear from him. And we're, I'm so glad to be able to work with him on student Senate. He is so lovely. and. He's been so patient and kind and helpful, and he's taught me so much. And on a happy retirement. I'll pass it on to Trustee Vinalankara. Thank you, uh, Trustee Bao. I, I echo Trustee Bao's comments. Um, I first met Associate Director Bogue uh, four years ago, actually, when I was in grade eight, and I sat on the French Advisory Committee. And I see him nodding, but I didn't think he actually remembered that. <laughs> um, so he, he has greatly supported uh, the Student Senate through the years, as, as well as us student trustees. Um, and I know he makes his best effort to listen to student voice and to consider student voice. You know, even at these very long and jam-packed board meetings, I know we can always count on Associate Director Vogue to pay close attention to our thoughts and to our ideas and really everything that us students have to share. Um, as student trustee, my interactions with Associate Director Vogue have empowered me to be a stronger and wiser advocate for my peers um, and also for myself. So on behalf of the Senate and all student trustees present and past, and also all students of the HESB, we wish you all the very best and we thank you uh, for everything that you've done. Um, all the best in the next chapter of your life. Thank you so much. Uh, Trustee Amos has some further words. Um, I know this isn't the last time we'll get a chance to speak about Associate Director Bogue, but 
Um, David, I, I just couldn't let you get away without saying congratulations. We'll miss you. And I know that you've got lots of things you can do after you retire because you, you've already, we know what a great actor you are. We know that you like working on old cars or you have an old car maybe that you have, want to work on. Um, and I mean, you love dogs. So there's lots of dog training and I can show you some tricks your dogs could learn if you want. And uh, I know that uh, you just, you, you have so many things that you'd like to be involved in and do that you, you're not going to retire and just sit back and do nothing. So um, this like, I just wanted to, say how much we'll miss you because of the impact you've made on the board and thank you for everything you've done but i know we'll get another chance and director ennis you're not allowed to bring any more of these announcements to the board because i'm going to be a wreck by the end of this if you want to see me crying at the end of every board meeting then go ahead but no more <laughs> thank you trustee amos uh Associate Director Bull, would you like a couple of seconds? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. I, I just want to say thanks all, to all of you for your kind words. Uh, Vandy, I do remember you in grade eight on our French advisory committee, and I knew then you were going to change the world. I, I, I knew that back then, and, and you were already well on your way. I just want to say it's been a real um, honor and a pleasure to work in um, an organization where relationships matter and where the organization values its employees and provides opportunities for growth and development. And, and uh, just by happenstance, I, I, in many ways, was at the right place at the right time and was able to, to take on a variety of different roles. Um, uh, the, the, the one that, of course, I will cherish the most is really my time as a senior team member because I've had an opportunity to work with all of you, great superintendents and directors in the past, great trustees, uh, this board being being the absolute best group of trustees I've worked with. And I say that sincerely. Everyone on the call really has just been outstanding uh, leaders and advocates for for change and for uh, whatever's in the best interest of our kids. And, and for that, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very appreciative. And it's been a real pleasure. So thank you all. And I know we'll have lots of opportunity to chat further, but uh, uh, it's it's been uh, it's been great working with all of you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Associate Director Bold. We wish you well on the next phase of your journey, and uh, we sure will be carving out some time to celebrate with you before you leave us. All right, uh, I forgot one uh, item, uh, Chair Shuttleworth. I, I forgot, I was remiss to mention the Terry Fox Foundation sent me a letter uh, just a few days ago that the Halton District School Board raised $199,066.80 in 2021 towards the Terry Fox Foundation and Cancer Research. And E.J. James, one of our very own school, ranked 19th in the province of Ontario in the elementary schools as they placed within the top 50. So congratulations to all the schools in the Halton District School Board who participated and to EJ James for their valiant and great effort. And with that, I close my director's report. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Director Ennis. Um, so I'm just going to give everybody a five minute break um, to if you're feeling a little teary eyed as many of us might be after David's discussion. Uh, take five minutes and we'll meet back here at, we'll say 10 to 9.
great. I see. Five of us. We're a minute early, earlier than I said we would be. Six. Ah, oh, director it is. Seven. Awesome. There we go. But we'll honor our seven or eight fifty start time again. So just give it a second or two more. Okay, thank you very, very much for being so prompt in your return. Okay, we are now up to item 6.6, .6, which is communication from the chair. Uh, this has been a really quiet week. We haven't received any letters from any other boards towards the minister. However, I would like to address our plan in moving forward with our board meetings. We as a board are looking at our options regarding resuming the in-person meetings. However, we also want to respect everyone's comfort level. We are conscious that we must be flexible and in doing so provide options so that all can attend and feel comfortable in the environment that they're in. We are therefore moving towards a hybrid approach in upcoming meetings. Staff and trustees will have the choice to come in person to the board meetings or access the meetings via an online approach. As we move through these new and ever-changing times, we continue to adapt our practices. And although we were really hoping to have this approach up and running for the next board meeting, which is the 2nd of April, technical glitches and maintenance concerns has pushed it back to the first meeting in May. But we look forward to seeing everybody up close and personal a little bit sooner. Um, and that's it for my communications. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Wonderful. So now we're up to committee reports. I received no digital reports, but does anyone from the board have any committee reports to bring forward? Excellent. None. So that brings us to trustees, questions, and comments. Are there any questions or comments that trustees may have? I do have a question if nobody else has one, but I'm waiting for somebody else to ask first. <laughs> there we go. Uh, trust, ooh, I don't, trust eager bets. Uh, actually, I'd like to defer to uh, Vice Chair Al Harrison first, because okay, it probably okay. is similar. Okay, Vice Chair Al Harrison. You're on mute. Muted. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I receive every day um, an email uh, from Mayor Rob Burton, and in the uh, his daily message yesterday, there was uh, a statement from Dr. Magani, uh, which talked about uh, the rising caseload in terms of COVID-19, and there was a statement in there just regarding strongly recommending Halton residents continue wearing high quality masks in indoor settings. Now, I do understand that public spaces as they relate to municipalities and schools have been treated differently during the pandemic. They fall under different um, ministries uh, and different local agencies. However, we're all under that same local board of health. Uh, and so I wonder whether we've heard any different or changing direction uh, in, in that regard. I think one of my colleagues sent a message, uh, a newspaper article also noting increasing case loads. Thank you, Vice Chair Al Harrison. And I'm actually going to follow up with that really sort of, I guess, as a summary. So um, given the rise in cases that have been seen in Halton, has public health changed their guidelines for masking and other protocols within school? 
Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Shuttleworth and Vice Chair L. Harrison. I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Blackwell to respond to that. Uh, thank you. Through the chair to uh, the chair and the vice chair. Um, uh, these, it's a good question. We have also received some questions from families uh, regarding messaging around masking and wondering if there is an anticipated change. Uh, as you know, we meet weekly with public health and a lot of the items that are on our agenda are generated by us and things that impact our staff, our families and our students. And they come often from uh, communication that we receive, uh, not only from families, but from our staff and, and then information that other uh, senior team members uh, would like to get answers to. So uh, we met today and uh, the question that uh, we asked is, were there going to be uh, any considerations for different direction around masking or any considerations and uh, Halton Region's Associate Medical Officer of Health has confirmed with us today uh, that the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health are not having any discussions at this time to bring back masking mandates or any other public health measures. Um, one of the things that uh, they did mention um, also is that uh, you know, vaccinations, uh, we're seeing a, a, a slow, uh, slow increase in vaccinations and boosters, which is something that, you know, we all have the ability to access. Uh, not everyone can get a booster yet. Uh, we are seeing our, our student numbers increase, especially with our uh, first and second doses uh, with our five to 11 year olds. Uh, but just a reminder that uh, that, that is available and, uh, uh, again, um, you know, we, we've had questions around masking and when is masking required and they haven't seen it on the screening tool. I know that families are keeping kids home. We report our absences and um, so with that screening tool, uh, when they receive that, that go to school, uh, please make sure that you scroll all the way down. Um, it is available in hard copy if you don't have a copy at home. Uh, we can print it in multiple languages if, if you need it, uh, but there are some specific pieces around when masking is still required. And uh, so long story short, uh, there is no, can, no discussion at this point on changing that direction. Uh, thank you, Trustee Bow. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I just had a question whether we know if regular Ontario exams are going ahead. Dr. Ennis? Uh, thank you. I have not heard any um, report on uh, any cancellation of exams. Wondering if Associate Director Bolg, if you've heard anything uh, to that regard. Uh, thanks, Director Ennis. No, our, our planning right now is to, um, you know, again, try to get back to some kind of more of a typical uh, end of uh, semester routines. And so we're planning for for that and should things change you know again we're always we one thing that we've learned is to be nimble and and to adjust where necessary but at this point in time it's sort of uh business as usual and we hope that it will continue that way <clears throat> thank you thank you uh trustee prevents yes thank you through the chair um, this goes back to uh, what Vice Chair Al Harrison said. Um, you know, like today in the science, the science team said we are looking at 100 to 120 new cases of COVID every day in Ontario right now with the wastewater. 120, 100, 100,000 cases. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and they are, of course, saying masking uh, uh, will help us get through this. That's what Dr. Uni said. And it is, I, I find it, um, I know students, uh, anecdotally, I'm related to a few and they have friends and friends and friends, and they're all very uh, scared of uh, not necessarily getting COVID, but being shut down into a remote learning situation again. Um, 
and uh, and it could if the cases grow and um, <clears throat> we could end up in in that kind of situation. We also have students that are ineligible to get vaccines. Uh, children do not live alone. They live with younger siblings as well that cannot uh, get vaccinated or uh, maybe immunocompromised uh, themselves or family members. Um, and I know that the minister has said no mask mandate. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, can we as an educational organization encourage, encourage masking? You know, uh, posters, uh, messaging, uh, things like, please mask. It's a small ask. Like, let's let's get the message out to say, you know, you don't have to, but, you know, empathize with the people around you. Um, <laughs> how about, because it is a very small thing to put mask on your face. Um so uh, I was wondering if uh, if the staff would consider doing that. Um, I, I and also um, when students are uh, returning from being away, um, if they could specifically their family specifically receive information saying, you know, if you have been away due to COVID, you must continue masking. Uh, I think that people. I think the information gets lost. Uh, there's a lot of information. So, you know, targeted information, maybe better, a weekly reminder um, from schools, things like that. Um, because there are still times, of course, that uh, Superintendent Blackwell have mentioned that uh, masking is still required, but I don't think people are really um, necessarily doing it. Uh, so, uh, if we could all do our part, that would be wonderful. If we could have, uh, a, a, you know, some encouragement through education, uh, marketing, that kind of thing, that would be wonderful. Um, I just, I find it so fascinating that that our own medical officer of health is saying, you know, people should be masking indoors when they can't social distance. And that is the definition of our classrooms. Um, so. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Director Ennis? Um, I would, if uh, if Trustee Oliver's quest in our comments is on this topic, I'd rather wait. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, Trustee Oliver. Yes, thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, I agree with that sentiment. I think that we as a board can do more around our own um, uh, health uh, and health uh, protection uh, with communications around masking. I think it's important for people to understand that, um, you know, when you wear a mask, the mask protects you as well, and it protects others um, from you should you be infected. And so it, you know, it does everybody good to be wearing a mask. And I don't think we need to be, um, you know, there are variations in mask qualities, of course, but I, you know, any mask will be better than no mask at all. And I understand that the general public is uh, fed up with masking. They're all looking forward to returning to normal. Uh, you know, the, uh, the removal of the masking mandate gave everybody some hope that, um, you know, we're on the uh, tail end of the pandemic, that things are improving, our lives are coming back to normal. But in fact, we're seeing that that's not the case. And the new wave that we're seeing is a reflection of the changes in our behaviors. So doing away with masking, loosening a lot of the other restrictions, um, that has a direct impact on what we're seeing in terms of the spread of the virus. And so, you know, I, I had one opportunity to be in school very briefly, and of course wore my mask. Um, and that was, uh, you know, at, at that point, I noticed that a lot of the, this was a high school, um, a lot of the students were in fact wearing masks, but I'm hearing from, uh, you know, my niece, who's a young student, that in the elementary grade levels, um, there is, a, you know, peer pressure comes into play. And 
children want to do what their peers are doing and they're not fully understanding or whatever it might. So it's, it's that messaging and it's making and normalizing that wearing masks is a good thing. It's a support, you know, supporting your peers, encouraging, not, uh, not being dismissive. And, uh, you know, any communication around that, I think will go um, a long way. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to, to say. And just, yeah, I encourage everyone to continue to wear a mask in a public place, in a school, encourage their children to do so. I know some of us will come up against resistance, even within our own families, but, uh, you know, we do the best we can and we support others in doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, this is this is a very uh, difficult issue. Uh, it's difficult because, you know, we've been having the conversation about masks for over two years now. This is the third school year in which we're having a conversation about masks. And uh, many were elated, as you know, uh, when the government lifted the mandates on masking. Um, and they couldn't wait uh, for the opportunity to get out of them. Um, you know, many, of course, continued to choose to wear them. And so the issue of choice was one that was squarely placed on individuals um, to decide what was best for them and for their families. And so that's been the message that, uh, you know, we have uh, given that those who uh, choose to wear masks or those who chose not to wear it, um, you know, we are, we're trying to create harmony and acceptance and inclusion within our school spaces, whether you choose to wear mask or choose not to wear mask. And uh, one of the things that worries me is that the idea of um, you know strongly recommending mask in schools, um, you know, will will create friction and division uh, in ways that um, is not necessary. I I do I do I don't think that those who who have the right to at this very moment to not wear mask are going to wear mask because. Uh, you know, we say we encourage them to wear masks because they they felt that they were free and they were being forced to do something they didn't want to do in the first place. Um, so I'm not sure if we're going to change hearts and minds on this. While I support, um, you know, encouraging as many to wear masks as possible, I don't know that we're going to change hearts and minds on this. And so I, I am afraid of the, the consequences of implementing any kind of strong language around mask wearing when they don't have to. Uh, by the mandate of the province, and that will create division in our schools, and I, I think that would be an, an unfortunate outcome. Esti Rocha. Uh, through you, Chair. Thank you, Director, um, for recognizing that, because I, I honestly feel that we're at a place where we have been told We've been following public um, health uh, matters and we've always been doing what they've asked us to do. And now that we're giving students the choice to wear or not wear a mask, we need to support their choice. We cannot make students who choose not to wear masks feel bad and we cannot make students who choose to wear a mask to feel bad. Um, we need to support their decision, the student's decision and the family's decision. So I cannot see, and I wouldn't support us promoting one thing over another. If we are following public health, then that's what we should do. And we need to encourage students, staff, to really honor people's choices and to be comfortable and respectful, respectful of people's choices. Thank you, Trustee Rocha. My concern is the mixed messaging that I struggle with. So that public health in one breath says, wear masks in indoor places, indoor public places, and in the next breath say, don't wear masks in schools. So I'm wondering, uh, Director Ennis, how do we make the masks in school available? Are they visually, where, where, but I'm just wondering if there is sort of a, a way we can work, work magic. So 
how do students access the free mass that they are given by the ministry? And same with staff. Whereabouts are they located? I don't know if you know the answer to that. Um, I do know that, uh, and uh, Superintendent uh, Black will stay on. I do know that uh, you know all schools still have masks available for anyone who needs it. So, Superintendent Black, will over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Director Ennis, and through the chair uh, to the chair. Um, you may not know, but kids do because they've been living this for two, three years, right, or two years. Uh, we've had masks available. They're on tables when people walk into buildings. Um, there's masks available in classrooms where where they have them. Uh, you know, it's up to the school to develop a process. So I won't speak to a specific situation um, because we every school has a, a routine that they have in place. But, you know, the conversation around masking and knowing about masking and what masking does, our kids are, they're aware right? They're very much aware, their families are aware, and the decisions that they're making are based on what they are understanding about mask wearing and, and, and their choices as a family or as, as, a, as director in a, in a set uh, or as a student where they're age appropriate. So, um, you know, they, they have that information. Uh, I think they've probably seen more masking signage in schools than uh, at every single door and poster than um, any other signage in our buildings over the past couple of years. Uh, so the reminders and, and you'll see kids walking to school with masks and you'll see kids walking to school without masks. You'll see them in buildings with and without masks and, and you'll see them interacting um, and treating each other with that dignity and respect that uh, and, and uh, harmony that D Director Ennis mentioned as well. Uh, so schools have that information. If parents wanna reach out, they have questions about where masks are available in schools please reach out and contact your schools because they have them. We have also shared that PPE has been provided for staff and masks are provided for students till the end of the year. The, the whole PPE discussion earlier this evening, it keeps coming uh, and we have it and, and it's being replaced. So it's being used. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, I, I would like to continue on this thread of masking by choice. Um, certainly, I, I appreciate that we're limited in our ability to mandate anything outside of the public health. So I, I respect that. But I'm I'm getting a lot of messaging from community members, from parents, who feel we need to reinforce or ed educate more on instances when children must wear masks, when they're away, um, when they've left the country, um, when they've had post-COVID infection, um, when a household member has close contact test positive. What I have heard from individuals is this, um, is that parents are not reinforcing this messaging um, and that there is an opportunity perhaps for us to continue that education piece um, that that's you know that that those are instances when children and staff and member visitors must mask um, and I have had uh, you know community members who've um, reached out to me who wanted to me to point to where the masking after a vacation outside of Canada came from. And they, they couldn't believe that because there are no mask mandates. But there are mask mandates in these instances. So my, 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 my comment is one in which what can we do to help support um, parents um, in their uh, assistance to helping their children um, make uh, the right choice when they're coming into school and they must mask. Uh, thank you for that, Trustee Reynolds. Uh, we do support um, the times and the guidelines and directives around when um, individuals should wear masks. And I wonder if uh, Superintendent Blackwell might just uh, illuminate for us uh, where parents and community and staff and students can find the information 
and uh, how we can help to illuminate that for everyone. Well, thanks. And through the uh, chair to uh, Trustee Reynolds, uh, we do have a families uh, document that's called uh, isolation requirements for families and, uh, uh, and for parents and guardians. And that document has been revised multiple times uh, since the start of the pandemic. Uh, that is something that our school offices have. Our, uh, when I walk into schools, the secretaries uh, that are working in our buildings um, and that are supporting our students with attendance, when they are aware that students or families are away or students are away, they will communicate with families that uh, whether the information on that document or sharing the document as a, a readable PDF file for them, uh, that's something that they continue to provide and schools often have those conversations. Kids come in and say, I just came back from Florida. It's a call home if they don't have a mask, right? Like we've always done. Um, and uh, when kids are away, uh, we know that they're away and we follow up uh, if they've been away for multiple days and share that information. We don't ask um, why they're away because that's something that we have, uh, that's not our business. We trust our families. We've said this multiple times. Our families are very good uh, in terms of following the guidance. They know the symptoms of COVID. I think kids probably know them um, more than their parents know them right now um, and are able to, uh, you know, we can communicate to families with that information without asking, right? And sharing the updates. We also know that our schools receive communication from us weekly uh, and they also share some of that communication with, with their schools in the community forums that work best for them. So whether they're posting something, whether they're messaging it through their weekly messaging, uh, or it's a it's a central letter from our communications department. But there's there's multiple prongs to to reaching out and and even a phone call just to say hey don't know if you're aware uh, this has changed since for the tenth time uh, we need you to uh, to ensure that your child comes with a mask and if not we'll provide them with a mask. So um, I guess the the important thing is if we're aware that a student should be masked and they're not masked it's our responsibility to uh, work with the family to get that mask in place. Thank you for um, clarifying um, that our staff are assisting in that compliance. Thank you. Are there any further questions? I know this is a difficult, this unknown piece is just such a difficult, difficult conversations, but I think it's really important that we get them out on the floor and make sure that we're aware of what is in place within our school board. I trust you all. Oh, thanks through you, Chair. Um, yeah, it is, a, it is a difficult conversation, difficult topic. And, you know, I, I agree with you, Director Ennis, on, the, on, on, on your um, thoughts and what you've said around, you know, some people just will not change their minds. And, you know, some people never wanted to wear masks. And, and majority of people are happy to do away with them. Um, as you all know, I'm a huge um, advocate and supporter of public health. But I find this time it's a bit more challenging because there is a discrepancy between, um, you know, the direction that the province has taken and what a number of, um, uh, you know, allied uh, health agencies and what the science table is saying. And when I see that kind of disconnect, it really concerns me. I know from members of public health that uh, they themselves are not, uh, and I'm not talking about Halton, um, because I didn't speak to anybody there, but I'm talking, I was speaking with other regions, um, that, you know, they share different opinions and it questions, uh, it brings to question, you know, the, the consultative process that takes place between the chief medical officer of health and the regional medical officers of health and the science table, and then how that information is fed up and absorbed by the province and what they do with that. And when I see the disconnect between the different uh, health agencies and the direction we're heading and what we're seeing with uh, spikes in uh, cases and all the different indicators um, that are used to predict uh, the trend, um, it's, it's concerning. 
And so I'll leave it at that, but I am personally encouraging people to, to wear masks um, as much as they can and are able to. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Oliver. Are there any further questions? Trustee Reynolds. Okay, on a different topic um, through the chair, um, and I'm, I, I can't recall whether this was the instance in last year's Have Your Say survey, um, but I do know that 2019 and previous, the Have Your Say survey was shared out to not only staff and students, but to community members. And I note that this has, this is different. Um, it doesn't include community members. And I was just hoping to understand why. Uh, over to Associate Director Bog. Uh, thanks, Director Ennis. Uh, through the chair to Trustee Reynolds. I believe the last administration uh, we did we did not uh, do the community uh, as well, uh, Trustee Reynolds. Um, the first two times we did uh, we did do the community at large, and we actually sent out invitations to a number of community uh, agencies and neighbors and partners that we were aware of. And the response rates were, I think, don't quote me, but I think one year it was 55, and the next year it was 30 three or something in the low 30s. And so it was really impossible to do anything with the with that data. It didn't have any statistical relevance. And we thought, um, you know, let, let's focus on our families, which we get a great response on, and our students and staff, obviously. But the community, we, we thought it was a good idea to reach out, and we, we tried to reach far and wide, but the response was just not uh, uh, not really relevant. And so we, we have discontinued that, that one. Thank you. Okay. Anything further with trustee questions and comments? All right. Thank you very much. We are now on to item 6.9, public questions. So on the HSB website, there's a button on the live stream page for a link at the for the bottom of tonight's agenda to allow members of the public to ask questions of the board. Questions received may be answered during the meeting, particularly those related to the agenda items or at the following meeting at the discretion of the chair. For efficiency, multiple questions received that are similar in nature may be grouped together again at the discretion of the chair or the vice chair. Questions will not be attributed. When necessary, a notation will be made that multiple people ask the same question. And any questions that contain language that is hateful or discriminatory will not be considered. Vice Chair Harrison, are there any questions submitted this evening? Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, there were a number of questions that were submitted in the time frame between meetings, and they related to a specific individual in their program. So I have responded back to the person with some um, uh, direction just in terms of who to contact at their school to, um, to address those uh, questions. I'm not confident that they're watching tonight uh, just because of when they were submitted. And really the purpose of these questions, as I understand it, are to look at things that are on our agenda and or kind of broad policy things that trustees are, are responsible for and those topics that relate to, you know, what's happening in schools, um, program and so on are really best responded to by the school. So therefore, that's where the person was directed. And if there are any follow-ups, please also they can reach out to me or the trustee from their area for additional uh, advice and guidance. All right, thank you so much, Vice Chair Harrison. So as you mentioned, there are many ways to bring questions to the board table. Uh, first and foremost, as Vice Chair Harrison said, 
you have a local trustee and that local trustee is always there to answer your questions. If you drop them an email or give them a phone call, trustee contact details are available on the website. So that would be your first sort of, I would say option. Then if not, you can use the link for the meeting that was on the website. And with that, that brings us to 7.0, which is adjournment. Now, I know as we move into these more difficult times and have these difficult conversations, it's sometimes hard to remember the end. The end hopefully still is, in, is near. Um, I think it's really important above all that we continue to be kind, respecting people's decisions and recognizing that we all have that choice to keep each other safe. Um, I appreciate all the conversations that we had this evening and I really hope you have a wonderful evening. Um, and that is it with nothing left on the agenda.